Thank you so much, Stacey. And hi, everyone. So great to see so many of you here this morning. Welcome to session six on protecting children across borders. Thank you very much for taking the time. Uh, so this session is, has been organized jointly by the Case Management Task Force and the Unaccompanied and Separated Children Task Force of the Alliance. So my name is Catherine Williamson. I'm head of humanitarian child protection for Save the Children, and I co-lead the Case Management Task Force. And my co-facilitator here today is from the Unaccompanied and Separated Children's Task Force. This is Jerry Abdallah, who's the IRC Child Protection Technical Advisor. So why are we focusing on this issue? This is because of the scale of the issue of the problem, the severity of the risks to children, and the complexity involved in responding to address those risks. Um, I can't see the slides we're on actually. Uh, I assume you can see a slide with, with uh, that's it, fantastic. So in 2022, uh, UNHCR estimated that the number of people forcibly, forcibly displaced across um, from their homes exceeded 100 million for the first time. 32 million of these people were displaced across borders and approximately 41% of those, of those people were children. So we can extrapolate, we don't know the num exact numbers of children, but we can extrapolate that there were in excess of 11 million children who had been forcibly displaced across borders by mid 2022. And I can imagine that those uh, numbers have only increased. Um, if we go to the next slide. Of the 32 million people displaced across borders, 72% were from just five countries. These countries are Syria, Venezuela, Ukraine, Afghanistan, and South Sudan. And if we go to the next slide. Uh, and the top five hosting countries were Turkey, Colombia, Germany, Pakistan, and Uganda. And as you can see visually, those are, are often the neighboring countries of, of uh, countries with, in crisis. So of the, of the approximately 11 million children, an unknown minority are traveling alone or with adults who are not their primary caregivers. And if we go to the next slide, these children are at a heightened risk of a number of critical protection concerns, including exploitation, trafficking, detention, refoulement, and forcible return. Many children lack legal documentation, some present themselves as adults in order to avoid detection by authorities. Others are unable to prove that they are children and are treated as adults by border authorities, leading to a denial of their right to special protection. And if we click one more time. Despite the heightened risk, risks, this is a particularly difficult population of children to protect. Some of the reasons for this are firstly practical, the challenge of identifying children, so as, as mentioned, many children are actively avoiding contact with authorities or those services that may refer them to authorities. How do we best protect those children who don't want to be identified? Other children are hidden from contact by, by those who may be trafficking them for exploitation. The challenges are also principled, ethical, the, the challenge of determining what's in their best interest. So once identified, is it in a child's best interest to always refer them to child protection authorities when this risks their disappearance or to work with them to help them minimize risk in the choices they make? If the former, how do we ensure that, that they can trust the system if they're resistant to entering it? And if the latter, how do we manage legal compliance in the country of jurisdiction? The challenge is also legal of navigating different legal jurisdictions and upholding international legal obligations. So as children move across borders, they move from one legal jurisdiction to another, with implications for which duty bearers have the primary responsibility for their protection, both in national and international law, including refugee law. Um, moving from one jurisdiction to another also affects the movement of children's data across borders, and that undermines the ability to, to provide cross-border case management, and also complicates the tracking of children during population movements. And finally, of course, all of these challenges are situated within an ever-evolving geopolitical discourse, increasing humanitarian needs driven by the concurrent crises of conflict, climate change, and economic and political instability drive an increase in migration. And those migrants become the focus of polemic that places them as the cause rather than the consequence of instability, with significant implications for the political and populist will to uphold child rights. 
So we have significant learning from protecting children across borders and we have tools and guidance as well. But these challenges remain and they're, they're really complex and it requires us to put our heads together to consider what more needs to be done. So if we can move on to the next slide. So the objective of the session today is to explore the issue, build consensus on a need to act and define next steps for strengthening the protection of children across borders. But clearly 90 minutes isn't long enough to arrive at a roadmap, but if possible, we'd like to broadly define what should happen and consider what opportunities may exist to take this forward. So to do this, the session consists of two country regional presentations, um, a brief statement of, man of mandates and in international law, some group work um, based around scenarios and feedback in plenary, and then a brief consensus building on next steps. So without further ado, if we go to the next slide, I'd like to introduce you to our two speakers. First of all, we have Justine Abinateway, the Senior Child Protection Advisor from Save the Children, who will be speaking about protecting children across borders out of Ukraine. And then we have Do Dr. Martha Bregan, representing the International Association of Schools of Social Work, We'll be speaking about children crossing the southern border into the USA. So over to Justine. Thank you so much. Good morning, um, everyone. Uh, my name is Justine Abenaito. I'm a child protection advisor with Save the Children, and I'm going to be speaking about uh, children moving across borders uh, with. Uh, affected by the Ukraine conflict. Uh, beginning of February or last year, uh, 2022, to date almost 7.5 million children have been displaced and are victims of the largest human displacement um, crisis in the world today. And this is um, from the explosives uh, and attacks in the populated urban areas um, and residential areas within and across Ukraine. Um, children and their families have taken refugee in neighboring countries, uh, fled to other parts of Ukraine that are relatively safer and or are trapped in escalating hostilities. We see very many children still stuck where the attacks are happening, approximately 5 million children are displaced inside and outside of Ukraine. Uh, nearly 100,000 children were living in institutions and boarding facilities prior to the conflict. And almost half of those children were living with disabilities. This is a very high number um, of children compared to uh, other countries across. And this has a lot of meaning and impact on children, um, especially when we have lost so much control uh, because of the escalated conflict. Next slide, please. Uh, the challenges um, the children are facing, there is limited or no access to services, uh, both on transit and in country of asylum. Uh, for children that have already settled into uh, Poland, we did a survey about a month ago and 17% have access to, have li uh, oh, they're the only children that have access to psychological and sports activities and logistical related, and this is because of logistical related challenges. Um, most of them suffer long journeys. If you uh, look at the map of Ukraine, uh, maybe later you realize that the um, frontline conflict is happening in the east part of the country and um, for children to access safety or the next borders, they'll have to move uh, uh, two day, three day long distances from the east to the west where they can access uh, Poland, they can access Romania, they can access um, other countries through uh, Poland and or Rom Romania. So uh, the distances on, in which they have to take to access safety are very long and along the way they don't have access to services. Um, 
where they go in the countries where they, they settle or choose as um, countries of asylum, we, they, they suffer issues of language barrier, limiting them to access services and fully integrating into the community that is hosting them. Um, we also see uh, separation of children uh, from caregivers. Uh, most of the children travel alone or with adults that were not their primary caregivers. Um, avoid, and then with that, they then avoid uh, contact with border authorities. Um, so they use porous borders to enter those countries. And or sometimes, which we have seen a lot uh, with the Ukraine crisis is that children that were in institutions, as Alia mentioned, um, they travel within the institution um, uh, that, that they were in and they are not documented. Uh, for example, they will not have individual case files for these children and they will cross the border as an institution. As an institution. And we have seen that, um, uh, for example, Ukraine uh, government uh, uh, declaring that uh, they still hold responsibility of the children in institutions or the institutions. So the countries that are hosting these institutions do not um, then take responsibility or enter these children into their child protection system. And this um, uh, affects how uh, stakeholders or service providers are able to identify individual children um, uh, uh, protection concerns and this becomes a challenge to be able to even provide individual or services. And that then increases the risk of children being trafficked and getting involved in illegal activities. Next slide, please. Um, we also see um, children crossing from institu uh, in institutions are often or not individually documented and the institutions have limited resources uh, to support the children system. And the fact that they are not uh, integrating into the protection system, the expectation is that um, then the Ukraine, um, uh, the Ukraine uh, government or the Ukraine authorities continue to provide services for the children across the border in their institutions, which is not possible or which is uh, not happening because there's limited resources now allocated to um, uh, social protection um, since uh, the country is under war and they have priority, they, they are prioritizing their resources to other, um, other needs, including uh, military, uh, military resources that they require to continue. Uh, to protect the country. Um, we also see children that, are in, that initially cross the border um, on an arranged care with the either neighbors or extended relatives and so do not register as separated. Um, so when they get into the country, um, they haven't registered as separated. They have not registered through the uh, child protection system. Um, then eventually the, 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 the caregivers that had taken them on find it difficult to continue to support the children. They can't meet their needs. And then they abandon the children. And then the children have to go back to the system to seek for asylum. Um, and many, we have seen this leaving many children without care and at very high risk. And, and with the Eastern Europe, uh, the, the high risk of um, uh, trafficking that is uh, facing children, especially uh, teenagers. Uh, we also see the legal frameworks uh, related to protection of children and legal responsibility for an accompanied and separated okay. children. Okay, I'll share this slide with you. Jimmy, you taking the um, head. Uh, talking about children by children in Ukraine, uh, especially this in Uganda. You can take that as a module one or module one. 
Can we remind everyone to mute themselves? Thank you. Participants, please may I remind you, you were muted upon entry. Please do not speak while the speaker is speaking. Save any questions and remarks for afterwards, please. Okay, thank you. Um, going back, uh, the legal framework related to the protection of children and legal responsibility for unaccompanied and separated children uh, in residential or foster care. Uh, in Poland, the responsibility still remains with Ukraine and Ukraine is not in position to continue providing or uh, supporting and monitoring um, the, 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 the institutions. And that leaves uh, children with very high needs. And looking at the, the, um, the recent, uh, I think two or three weeks ago, um, the, the Ukraine local authorities calling back the institutions uh, to go back to Ukraine, yet um, the, where they were inviting them back to is not safe. Um, there were no BIDs that were conducted for children, individual children, um, and, and some children had, were at very high risk, especially children that were living with uh, very critical disabilities. Um, there is a, a limited or lack of legal documentation um, to allow children access services, especially education, health. Uh, and this is usually because um, either children entered as an institution, and that means there was no registration for children individually, but also children that entered through the porous borders and never registered with authorities, and all they came with caregivers and later, uh, the caregivers abandoned them and they hadn't, uh, uh, they didn't have legal documentation to be able to access services. Next uh, slide, please. Yeah, um, then we have a situation for uh, children that's, and can we go to the next slide, please, uh, Stacy? Yeah, we go to the recommendations. Um, recommendations, what can we do to uh, improve the situation? or be able to respond to the situation. We, um, we talk about coordination. Uh, the response would benefit from strength and coordination between government partners, stakeholders to provide timely and quality services. Um, in, in some of the countries, the coordination is very strong and robust um, on specific thematics, uh, but in other thematics, you realize that the, the coordination is so strong. So um, for example, on uh, repatriation of institution, children in institutions, uh, providing services for children in institutions, that would really uh, benefit, um, coordination would really benefit uh, in ensuring that children receive timely and quality services. Um, the big word for deinstitutionalization uh, within uh, the response is very um, key, ensuring that children get out of the institutions, uh, they get alternative care, family-based care through case management in Ukraine and the receiving countries. Um, for countries that have received children in institutions, um, can we see a possibility where we get children out, attach them to foster carers or even reunite them with their biological families and then provide case management um, uh, through uh, the uh, family-based care or any other alternative care. Um, then integrating children into national systems uh, remains a key priority. Um, uh, for example, where children, um, even if they have moved into the, through an institutions, can we, ensure that they are integrated within the child protection system of the host country. And um, so children can be properly documented, uh, properly uh, integrated within the system 
which will enable monitoring, uh, service provision, and uh, ensure that risks are reduced. Then uh, we also look at uh, providing uh, contextual, uh, contextually relevant services, uh, for example, uh, child care services to enable caregivers and parents have uh, time to work and provide basic needs for their children. Um, when you look at some of the countries where um, the children have gone, uh, in fact, uh, uh, part of the survey that happened is, uh, was that uh, parents are willing or caregivers are willing to be able to provide for themselves to uh, support the children but and, and, and not just depend on either the, the, the mega resources that are provided by the system or, or even uh, by the humanitarians, they can be able to work and contribute to the economy of that country, but also be pro able to provide for their children, but they are limited by the uh, childcare uh, support. They probably most, as, as you could be aware that, um, uh, children that are moving, it's only children and women that are moving. So you'll find um, very many single-headed households and they do not have an alternative for, um, for anyone to, to, to remain home and care for the children. So if we can be able to contextualize and have childcare services that can um, uh, provide a bit of help and then the parents can fend for the children. Uh, then support families and caregivers with income generating activities um, in addition to supporting children to access education, um, especially in person classes as the, 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 the feedback from, from the children has come through that they, they want to have that interaction with um, other children, but also this would support uh, integration of these children within the communities where they have uh, sought asylum, and then um, uh, be able to access co-curricular activities and psychosocial support. Uh, there is also uh, an element of, um, of of children who uh, cross the borders and not be able to uh, register because the first country they have entered in is not the country they desire to. Uh, they desire to, to settle for us uh, for asylum if that can also be sorted out through uh, proper coordination um, with with among us the, the stakeholders uh, thank you so much over to you Pat hi everyone so thank you so much Justine if we move over to to Martha Bregan now to um, present on um, unaccompanied separated children at the US southern border. Thank you so much, Kat, and thank you all for taking the time on this. Um, so that more than 152,000 unaccompanied or separated children were placed in US custody at the southern border in 2022. Some of them, most of them came unaccompanied fleeing for their lives, 72% of these between the age of 14 and 17. Others, especially younger children, were accompanied by non-legal guardians, such as grandparents, adult siblings, extended family, community members, or paid caregivers, and separated at the border with the adults turned away, incarcerated, or deported. 93% of these unaccompanied or separated children came from Mexico and the Northern Triangle of Central America, 7% from all other countries. The distance, I should say, from the Northern Triangle or Southern Mexico takes at least one week and often several weeks, up to a month, month and a half to, um, to travel, and most of them are traveling on foot. Of those from Central America, 87% had a parent living in the US who had been sending remittances and could have taken up care with assistance. The remainder were in contact with relatives or community members who were known to them. Yet recent reports find children dying in US custody, sometimes by suicide, being sent back to danger 
or engaged in hazardous labor as they are rushed quickly out of dangerous situations in custody to a person who is not their parent or relative, but someone who may be a trafficker claiming, um, giving a better case for the claiming of sponsorship. Sponsorship in the US requires complete financial responsibility for the child. Next slide, please. Why are they coming? Cold War politics led to proxy conflicts in El Salvador and Guatemala. And an accompanying genocide in Guatemala forced the indigenous majority off their lands and limited the area where they could grow crops. Development constraints and austerity also forced farmers off their lands in Honduras. Climate change also affected the ability of poor communities to support themselves. Unaccompanied and separated children fleeing Central America during these conflicts were not given refugee status and jailed in the US where they encountered and had to survive carceral and violence. When these children completed their sentences, they were deported to Central America, often attracting drug cartels in their own countries. 10% of the combined population of these countries, whoops, oh my goodness, sorry. 10% of the combined population of these countries were living in the United States as of 2019, and global remittance flows made up roughly one fifth to one quarter of each country's GDP in 2021. Development driven displacement accompanied by climate change in Mexico has also led to a dangerous rate of murder there, both generalized homicide and femicide in the city. It has been customary in earlier times for people from the Americas to come back and forth to the US, but a 1968 law helping those fleeing communism to enter the US legally also limited the number of migrants from the Americas for the first time. Those limits remain in place, forcing this new flow of refugees. Next slide. Okay. What happens when, what happens when the unaccompanied or separated ch or children who've been recently separated arrive. Children are apprehended by officials at the US Border Patrol or Office of Field Operations, both agencies of US Customs and Border Protection and placed in, um, in Customs and Border Protection facilities. The Customs and Border Protection officers detain the children in facilities while authorities determine whether they qualify as unaccompanied children. Some unaccompanied children are separated from adult guardians who are unrelated or from family members who are arrested for illegal crossing. And I was recently called to, to the courts to testify that it was customary for grandparents um, to take care of or accompany grandchildren when the parent had become ill or died. I don't know why this was considered strange. Under US law, some unaccompanied children from Canada and Mexico can be deported immediately. Immigration and Customs Enforcement manages the transfer of unaccompanied and separated children to the Department of Health and Human Services. The Office of Refugee Settlement, a department of HHS, can hold children in temporary influx facilities during emergencies, but it is supposed to arrange long-term shelter as soon as possible. U.S. Citizen and Immigration Services rules on asylum cases and the Justice Department rules on immigration cases. So what happens is that um, these organizations for refugee resettlement can't really do their work properly while the children are in these detention facilities. Instead, Health and Human Services works to do extensive background checks and home study to determine if children can be cared for by parents or other family members who are legal sponsors while they await asylum. If they clear background checks, they can be sent to their family or communities. However, most can't clear those background checks quickly because they're being done at very long distances. The children are kept near the border. Family members are often scattered around the country. Others, so those who don't clear the background checks, which is the majority, remain in custody 
or are released to unverified sponsors due to staff shortages and the difficulty of doing home studies at distances by telephone with sponsors who fear deportation. Court cases continue, children are eventually denied or deported, granted asylum and can stay or become adults or, or move to adult detention facilities. Next slide, please. So hopefully you're seeing my recommendations. There are really practical alternatives to this very painful and difficult situation for children. Of course, all recommendations should be made in consultation with local organizations of the asylum seeking families and communities of the children and the young people themselves. Further, if we overhaul the asylum conventions beyond 1951 to adapt to the needs of today's forced migrants, for instance, considering the Cartagena principles of 1984 that expand the definition of refugees to those fleeing violence and disorder, such as that experienced in many countries around the world that are not beyond the question of whether or not a person is individually persecuted for membership in a special group. That would make a big difference for the status of most of these children and families. Allow families to claim asylum together. Don't deport accompanying relatives, especially if they have paperwork that describes their relationship to the child. Provide adult care caregivers or sponsors with work authorization in the U.S. specifically, where the U.S. has a labels, labor so shortage, so that parents and legal guardians can support children legally, avoiding the need for illegal child labor. I remind you that in the U.S., if you are not a U.S. citizen or, or permanent resident or work authorization holder, you are not entitled, even as a legal migrant, to receive government benefits of any kind, including those for children. Change the well-meant requirements for intimate care, interim care from least restrictive environment to require immediate supportive placement with parents and relatives wishing to care for the child. That would put them under the jurisdiction of local child protection authorities that are in a much better position to care for the children, make sure the home situation is safe, and that the purported parents are not traffickers, and that the children are enrolled in school and given reintegration facilities, as what is required but for refugee resettlement, a care that is not currently being extended to these children. Thank you very much for your time and for listening. Thank you so much, Martha. And thank you, Justine, as well, for those, those fascinating presentations. Um, we're going to go into group work soon, uh, based around three scenarios. But before we do, this is an area, this is a, a protection issue that has a number of mandates um, based in international law. And I wanted to invite um, each of these agencies to just say, to speak for a minute about what their mandate is in relation to um, protecting children across borders. So first of all, can I ask Nazli Sanye to explain the role of ICRC? Um, hello, good morning, everyone. This is uh, Marta Trigiano, I'm Migration Advisor at the ICRC. I'm here indeed with my colleague um, Nazli. Uh, she's advisor on the protection of family links. Um, so uh, the ICRC, as you probably already know, has a mandate to protect and assist people affected by armed conflict and other situations of violence. Uh, when it comes to the protection of children across board, in particular migrant children, um, so uh, the ICRC, the ICRC mandate and migration intersect in the sense that the ICRC in particular protects and assists migrants that are caught in armed conflict or that are at risk to be returned to armed conflict and uh, separated missing and diseased migrants, um, as this is part of the wider um, mission role and mandate of the Central Tracing Agency, which is embedded within the ICRC. Uh, so. We, children are definitely a particular vulnerable group in the sense that they may be particularly exposed to certain protection risks 
including uh, when there are migrants to the risk of being separated, going missing or dying um, in country of transit or destination, including at borders. So um, in particular, um, in this sense, the ICRC operationally engages in, in different types of activities for, for uh, migrant children uh, to prevent the risk of being separated, going missing, uh, to, for the search. So for example, tracing, uh, sometimes to support also the authorities for the identification of human remains, uh, insert the circumstances for the reunification um, of, of uh, unaccompanied children, um, and then also to support the families um, of uh, separated and, and, and the missing in particular. So this is in a nutshell how our mandate uh, in, intersect with migration and what do we do for, um, for migrant children across borders. Thank you. Thank you, Marta. Um, and can I ask Severine Lacroix to explain the role of IOM? Catherine, I don't see that uh, Severin has joined us. Now that I look, I don't see any participants here, unless one of his colleagues or her colleagues might have joined us, but no Severin. Okay, is there, is there anyone from IOM? That, well, okay, don't worry. Maybe, um, can I ask Lauren Chapuy to explain the role of UNICEF? Thank you, Catherine. Uh, and, and thanks to the, the great uh, presenters uh, just before. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, UNICEF's role in, the, in that uh, area of work very much uh, based on the, on the CRC, uh, acknowledging uh, national authorities' uh, role as uh, duty bearers uh, for all children, whether national children, refugee, migrants, displaced children. So we see very much our role as uh, uh, supporting national authorities so that they can uh, deliver against their responsibilities in that, uh, in that regard. Uh, uh, that means that uh, we will particularly focus on, on their ability, national authorities, uh, civil society, uh, uh, ability to, uh, to support with uh, uh, best interest uh, uh, assessment. Uh, of the children, uh, especially when unaccompanied separated children crossing the border. Uh, this means uh, uh, investing in uh, family tracing and reunification uh, capacity at country level, in parallel with uh, 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 alternative care modalities while reunification uh, uh, options are being pursued for, for those children. What do we mean by alternative care? Very often it means uh, uh, promoting uh, family and community-based care. In some countries, those modalities are already in place. In some countries, they have to be uh, uh, started from, from, from scratch. Uh, very often in a, in a pilot uh, manner, uh, but also uh, in parallel with the efforts to reform uh, legislation so that gradually national legislation does uh, 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 provide for this type of care and for this type of care to become inclusive of uh, uh, refugee and uh, migrant uh, children. Linked with this, uh, we uh, uh, prioritize investment in uh, the national social workforce, meaning social workers, para social workers, uh, equipping them with uh, skills uh, uh, and uh, uh, knowledge so that they, they can uh, conduct those uh, best interest uh, assessment to a, a case management uh, approach. Um, I'm going to stop here because I think that's the gist of uh, UNICEF's work in this respect. Thank you. Thank you, Laurent. And finally, can I ask uh, Jessica Stewart-Clark to just um, briefly um, share the mandate of UNHCR in protecting children across borders? Sure, Kath, thank you. I mean, I'm never brief, but I'll do my, I'll do my utmost. Uh, UNHCR's mandate is derived from the 1950, the statutes established and set out by the General Assembly in 1950. So we have a legal mandate to be providing international protection to refugees. And this is really in the sense of providing protection as well as seeking permanent solutions. Um, 
since since 1950, this has really been expanded from refugees to also include stateless persons, asylum seekers, and returnees. So in order for us to uphold the legal mandate, um, we work with national asylum systems and child protection systems to ensure refugee and asylum seeking children, as well as stateless children and returnees can access and receive appropriate child protection services and durable solutions. And those durable solutions could include, for example, local inter inter integration in the country of asylum. It could uh, include voluntary repatriation to the country mm -hmm. of uh, origin if it is safe and truly voluntary, as well as, of course, resettlement, which unfortunately really is a uh, durable solution for about 0.01% of the refugee uh, population worldwide. There are also additionally complementary pathways, but the critical component, component of this from the child protection perspective is UNHCR's framework for child protection, which is the best interest procedure. So wherever national systems are unable or unwilling, UNHCR implements best interest procedure, also commonly known as BIP. And this is really for refugee and asylum seeking children to ensure that we are able to provide uh, support and assistance in their best interests, and particularly to help that in help in ensuring that decision making um, for, for forcibly just displaced children is done in a way with strict procedural safeguards. It is uh, designed around addressing the risks for children and promoting durable solutions as those that I mentioned in accordance with the framework as set out in the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And that's particularly within comment number 14. Um, Lastly, just to say that the best interest principle is absolutely integral to the work that UNHCR does underneath our mandate for international protection for refugees and for others of concern to UNHCR, as well as within the implementation of best interest procedures. Um, we use best interest procedures, particularly when it relates to children at heightened risk, such as unaccompanied children and for separated children in exceptional circumstances. And we use this to undertake family tracing, uh, family reunification, establishing alternative care. And it follows very much the same steps as the interagency child protection case management guidance but it does incorporate these specific and strict procedural safeguards such as best interest determination, for example. Um, and this is really articulated within the Convention on the Rights of the Child in comments number six and number 14. Thank you. Perfect. So uh, we are gonna take like, uh, you know, um, six minutes for, I mean, two minutes for each group to share some key information in terms of feedback on what comes up uh, and uh, I, I will start with our group uh, who are discussing more about the family separation due to a conflict but involving cross-border situation and uh, on question one about the actions uh, that needed to be taken uh, it was obvious that uh, we should focus on doing the assessment both for the children as well as the family who um, before I mean, during the tracing uh, process, there is also to think about the best interests of the child, you know, looking at the, the, the wishes of the children. And uh, other action is also to make sure that uh, we have a good registration data that is well informed. And uh, also uh, think about the best interest determination when it comes to think about the reunification of the child as well. Uh, and uh, in terms of who to be involved, yeah, obviously to involve uh, uh, case workers who are technically uh, trained to do that work. But uh, to keep in mind that uh, in cross-border situation or in such uh, requests, we need to think about the state that is uh, the main actor to be really involved into the process. We have also UNHCR who has that mandate for refugees, UNICEF as well as we have been listening from what they have presented, ICRC who has the mandate of cross-border reunification and IOM also as well who can be also um, involved into that. In terms of obstacle, some, 
some key obstacles that came up. We have documentation, that is one of the obstacles. The other obstacle is about the global environment while doing the assessment in terms of security on the side of the parents, the security, the cooperation of the family might be also an obstacle. And uh, who now to involve in order to face this obstacle, what can be done to overcome this obstacle is uh, ICRC is one of the main agents who is involved into the cross border and that they can also work and providing uh, uh, capacity uh, for emergency uh, 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 legal paper to facilitate the reunification if needed. Uh, they can facilitate and um, also it's also important to prepare the family in terms of action in advance so that they are ready to receive the children once back. Kat, what came out from your book? You are muted. My mute flicked on again. Uh, so my group was looking at a um, situation where children have been um, come across the border to other countries um, from institutional care, um, and they've had to register with the country of origin in their neighboring countries. Um, and then some of the local authorities in the country of origin ha have been liaising with, with the countries um, of asylum, essentially, to organize the return of children. Um, into including into areas of ongoing conflict. Um, so we're an agency that's working to, to provide care and protection for these children in the country of asylum. So we were saying that our group was discussing um, the need to need for concerted advocacy on different levels um, to ensure that um, the duty bearers involved are upholding the, the best interest of the child, that we're avoiding forcible return. Um, and that we are advocating um, at different levels with authorities, but also with governments um, and bringing in um, sort of uh, key actors like UNHCR and ICRC in that. Um, and we, we just started to talk about the complexity of uh, children returning, first of all, children returning to an active conflict zone um, and whether and when that's ever in a in a best in the child's best interest, but also um, return of children to institutional care, um, particularly if we don't if we're not aware of the situation for each child um, in the institutional care facilities. Um, these are we obviously as a sector advocate against institutional care and have concerns about um, the ne neglect and the potential systems of abuse within care. So that all of those issues need to be taken into account. But some of the sometimes the um, the politics involved in these things can be an obstacle. Um, whether the 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 authorities in the country of asylum, um, their diplomatic relations with the with the authorities in the country of origin. Um, so I think again, we advocacy at different levels was was the key sort of um, the key approach we would use advocacy to uphold the best interests of children. Thank you. And Thank lovely, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Over to Lori now for the last group. Thank you so much. Uh, so in our group, we were talking about adolescent boys who are moving illegally uh, into a country and trying to avoid the formal child protection system um, so that they can continue their journey. And um, us as an agency uh, are working in a country that requires mandatory reporting if we identify unaccompanied children. So we talked about what actions need to be taken. We talked about the fact that we need to be able to do best interest assessments, but then have parallel advocacy work as the other groups mentioned to prevent children from being detained and to actually be able to implement the findings from the best interest assessments. We also talked about um, supporting to have a variety of alternative care options available for these children. So because there was a risk of uh, detention for these children and that they would be detained with adults. So we wanted to look at foster care options um, and we wanted to look at supported independent living for these children. Um, and we also talked about creating safe spaces and drop-in centers that provide basic needs, but also allow for us to identify children. Um, we talked quite a bit about the, the biggest obstacle we had is, is a bit of an ethical dilemma as an agency. So is it in the best interest of the child to support them to have a safe journey? But so maybe we give advice on how to have a safe journey, but then we are breaking mandatory reporting. Um, or is it in the best interest of the child to refer them to social services when we know that there's a high risk they'll be detained? 
um, and that many are trying to avoid the system. So we talked about the kind of ethical dilemma that comes with that. Um, and one interesting uh, example to overcome these obstacles, uh, that's an example from SGBV, um, is that we, instead of providing services, we're providing advice. So seeing if that might be something we could explore. But essentially, we talked a lot about how this work would have to be done hand in hand with the authorities to be able to challenge some of those kind of existing policies and practices. I hope I've represented my group well. Thanks. Thank you, Laurie. Now uh, we go to the next uh, slide and we hand it over to Kat. Yeah, so we've had some really rich discussions today and we've heard um, for obviously from the US and from uh, Ukraine. Um, I just wanted to open it up to the plenary to, to get any ideas from, from people um, about what needs to happen next um, and what, you know, how do we take, how do we address some of these complex issues more effectively? Um, what needs to happen? Who needs to be involved in that? Recognizing that actually it's often a broader uh, group of stakeholders than humanitarian child protection. And also what opportunities exist to take this forward? Um, if anyone has ideas, please do put your hand up and uh, come forward. Laura, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, thanks, Kat. Um, I mean, th th there is a lot to say and, and I, I think that the time is uh, limited, but to me, it seems one of the main issues we are all uh, struggling with is while we appreciate and acknowledge the national authorities' uh, role uh, in uh, defining what is the best interest of the child from an, in an individual manner on both sides of, of the border, it seems that we are still struggling as to what that means in terms of uh, involving them in this uh, process. So for us as uh, humanitarians to, uh, to revisit how we go about that, how we approach, advocate with those national authorities, the type of support we, we are ready to, to provide, again, on both sides of, of an international border, for those authorities to be able to deliver against their mandate is, is something that would be worth um, investing in. Thank you. Thank you, Laurent. And uh, Maria. Yes, hi. Um, so no, I, I was just um, reflecting, you know, on the on the on the bigger question um, linked with the type of guidance that is needed for the humanitarian workers, you know, around this question of uh, case management, cross border case management. And I, I do think that there is a need to work on a joint, you know, guidance. I just, I just also think we need to be careful not to create a parallel, you know, mechanism because a lot is very much linked with, you know, the basics and the standard that we've been trying to work on, on case management generally. I would say so. I think that, and um, I was reflecting with uh, with Lourdes the other day discussing about that. And I, I really think that, you know, thinking about including a specific um, uh, chapter and attention when revising, you know, the coming guidance for, for child protection um, case management and humanitarian action, I think would be really relevant. And, um, and secondly, um, I also think, and I understand we're here to speak about humanitarian I mean, specifically linked with humanitarian settings, uh, but we all know that, um, you know, um, children crossing borders happening, not only linked with what we, um, you know, uh, uh, detail as a um, humanitarian context. And I think that we also, I mean, it would be good to have that also in mind, right? About the kind of more, you know, migration flows that, that's going to go and not always linked with um, huge emergencies, but linked also with, you know, severity and, and, and yeah, economic struggles and so on. So, yeah, that's my take. Thanks, Maria. I think there is a real opportunity there with the interagency guidelines, that revision, which is happening, start it, well, starting soon and will go on for the rest of this year. Um, what can we do to make sure that there is that chapter and that chapter is an, as effective as possible um, in, in guiding the sector on this work? So that's, that's a great, yeah. great point. Um, Laura, Laura Rev, sorry, <laughs> I can probably pronounce your name wrong. 
It, <laughs> thank you. It, look, it sounds like ravioli, so it's, uh, <laughs> it's easier. <laughs> So I would like to, to underline the, the psychological consequences on separation of the children from their family and uh, that mm, with severe repercussion also on mental health care systems. So I, that goes from psychological suffering to mental, very severe mental health disorder or behavioral disorder. And I think that this should be very, uh, it's, this, all these studies should be shared uh, in among the, the, the population and in governments because uh, they, they should know that what they do in before has a consequences also on the later politics and uh, economics issues. Thank you. No, I, I, I really um, appreciate that that link between mental health, psychosocial well-being and, and just peace and, and reconstruction and so on, it is really important. Lourdes. Uh, just adding on what has been already said, but, um, and now I lost a bit my thought, but I had an additional one, uh, when it was mentioned on the different alternative solutions, um, some of those solutions do, besides, uh, so one piece is quite important, which is the political buy-in and the advocacy on the CRC and on the, I mean, very basic uh, on the non reformment and other uh, actions, but then on the alternative pieces that we were discussing in the mandatory reporting group, for instance, it is also donors that, and, and it, it's much more expensive actually to do certain alternatives that are safer and that allow us to work in the best way. It has happened to us actually in the uh, having, for instance, supported living uh, options, which are, are more expensive and being shut down by donors saying that it was too expensive actually to provide a, a, an appropriate support. So uh, that I think that needs to be bared in mind too on, on uh, so, some of those. So when we say who we involve, of course, it's all the work with authorities and, and the ethical dilemma that we have within agencies, but it's, it is also within actually the work that we do within the, the even the project proposals that sometimes do not go through, even if we have the good solution. So at some point, or also a piece of that. Of course, in all the case management support, we know that this cost efficiency piece is quite important because we know as it is, but it's not usually bought by um, also donors. On, on it is it more human resource intensive, and and all this registration and all this individual uh, case by case support is is quite challenging still in in cross border and in certain settings where there is too much. Thank you, Lourdes. And Jessica? Uh, sure. I mean, th th three three quick thoughts that came to my head. The one was that I remember coming from an NGO background before I joined uh, the UN and also working in development and then into emergencies. I found a difference in the sense that I found working in development that local NGOs had a much stronger somehow position or role and uh, reception from local authorities um, in terms of their advocacy. Um, particularly in South Africa, where I started out my career, it was the local NGOs, the civil society, and those types of agencies that I found to be stronger allies for the international NGOs and really getting a message across. I'm not saying my experience is universal, but I have noticed that onwards. Um, in emergencies, particularly in other humanitarian settings, I think that we've got to put our working groups to work. All these endless coordination forums that we are in, these clusters, sub-working groups, sub-task force of this working group, activity group of that. These are really the venues that we need to put them to work and particularly the agencies in them that may have a, a stronger, for whatever reason, a stronger position or a stronger representation with authorities. I also think of the United Nations agencies that do have respective immunities and privileges when it comes to mandatory reporting and other types of things that perhaps we can capitalize on them as members of our groups rather than sort of big UN agencies elsewhere. They are members in our group and we are on the same level when we are in these forums. So that was uh, my second thought. And the last part was um, just that 
we really that that guidance uh, is is critical, and I think for humanitarian settings and settings that are including refugees, asylum seekers, and returnees, and uh, very selfishly coming from the information management for case management side. And CAF, I can see you saw this coming. We need to incorporate guidance on how we are sharing information cross border, particularly when it is data transfers from the country of asylum, state authorities, or state counterparts for children and families families back to the country of origin, how that information might be transferred. When it comes to UN agencies, again, with that immunities and privilege, privileges, there's an ability to, to make uh, data transfers in a safe, secure, and ethical way in the best interest of the child. Sometimes, perhaps, uh, where it is not in the best interest of the child to share that information with the government in the country of origin. But what does this mean for NGOs, for local NGOs, for international NGOs who are often applying GDPR, which may not be recognized or relevant in the countries in which we operate. And the UN has a role to support, but also to enable. Um, thank you. Thanks, Jessica, really appreciate that. And final, final comment from Justine. Yeah, thank you so much, Kat. I, um, I think I just wanted to highlight the issue of children in institutions. Um, I, I think uh, with the, uh, the the crisis in Ukraine and um, overflowing into uh, the other countries around Eastern Europe and other parts of Europe, we hadn't in in humanitarian um, child protection we hadn't really interacted a lot with with uh, children in institutions, and this is uh, one of of the kind that we have to either learn from um, and, and, and prepare ourselves and, and how do we really uh, work with countries that have been having children in institutions and now have conflict. And definitely there wasn't preparation to say that uh, we, we, we get children out or find a way to either work with our, our, our you know, apply our usual standards of children, um, uh, putting children into alternative care, working with uh, children in families. Here we are working with children in institutions and institutions being affected by conflict and being displaced across borders. And, and, and in this case, we don't have um, a clear guidance on how to work with, with such um, institutions or even just be able to support uh, the, the institutions to reduce risk um, and even work with the government to be able to uh, deinstitutionalize as, as soon as possible um, so that it is easier for us. So I, I think it's, it's high time that we, uh, at, at, at this level, we think through how we are going to be able to work with institutions where we find them and they have to move or children have to move because of either conflict or a disaster that has happened. How do we uh, design you know, uh, standards? How do we design approaches that can be able to uh, also work with, with children in, in systems that we, have, we are not clearly used to? Um, especially when they have to move and cross borders and how do we support the host countries to integrate these children within uh, their system? Are we going to support them to integrate within the institutions that are existing there or are we going to um, support the host countries to um, uh, provide um, uh, services based on alternative care, based on um, the, the basic, you know, uh, family-based care that we we are used to. So I think I'm, I'm I'm just highlighting that we are getting into scenarios that we are not used to, as as um uh at the, at the humanitarian space, and yeah, as 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 uh, someone just mentioned that we we need to work with local authorities, local. Uh, organizations to learn from them how they've been doing it, but sometimes you realize that they, the way they've been doing it is not what we know that we, we should do, 
and we probably have to find a middle ground to work with uh, this specific kind of children. And uh, that also hi had highlights uh, emphasis on, on children with disabilities. And I think this also, this situation also brings us to a very, um, to, to a situation that we are, we are not used to. I know within our case management uh, guidelines and our case management standards, we, we, we have a way that is already clear that we work with children with disabilities, but in situations where children have children with disabilities have been put into institutions and clearly families cannot be able um, to actually uh, support uh, the children with disabilities, even if they don't have, uh, you know, a parent, you know, unique protection concerns other than uh, being moved, but the fact that the families cannot take them on, um, and probably that is the reason they had put them into a boarding facility or something like that. How do we then work with, with them? Can we be able to learn from what is happening right now within Ukraine and to also help the, the response now and we prepare ourselves to respond better, but also prepare ourselves to, to respond to other, other scenarios that can come up that look like that. Thank you. Thanks so much, Justine. I think there's huge learning um, that we can take from Ukraine. I think that's something that's an action that we need to carry forward and see what, what learning is being gathered and what more we can gather and how we can use that. Um, so thank you, everybody. Uh, the Case Management Task Force and the Unaccompanied Separated Children's Task Force will come together to look at, um, review the discussions and, and the suggestions and make some suggestions to the Alliance about some next steps of what we can do to take this forward. And so if you have any other ideas, uh, if you know of opportunities that we can link this work to, do get in touch um, and we can we can see how we how we can take that forward. I can see that Lourdes has a uh... final comment because oh, we okay. did mention it within the get summit, but this is a wider audience and I would just yes. saw Jessica yeah, yeah. has mentioned, but mm having access to all the resources already existing since we talk about guidance and procedures would be yeah. great, uh, just to ensure that on the practical level, a bit of harmonization and, and there is a lot of existing, so. There is a lot of existing already, I agree. Yeah. Well, we're to put together, <laughs> but <laughs> existing. Thank you, Lourdes, absolutely. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate your participation today. Um, and thank you for the very rich discussions. Mm -hmm.